thank you all for coming today and participating in this timely discussion. We have two amazing industry heavy hitters joining us today. So without any further ado, let me uh, introduce you to them. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the best in the industry. First up is Dr. Jessica Lautz, the Vice President of Demographics and Behavioral Insights Mouthful at the National Association of Realtors. The core of her research focuses on analyzing trends for both NAR members and housing consumers. Through management of surveys and focus groups and data analysis, she presents new and innovative ways to showcase results. Jessica discusses research findings in major media outlets and international presentations. She received her doctorate of real estate from Nottingham Trent University in the UK. She also has a master's in public policy from American University and an undergraduate degree in political science and law and justice from Central Test. Central, I was about to say Central Texas, Central Washington University. Then we have our second special guest who is a ABOR fave. Uh, after retiring in 2020, economist Dr. Jim Gaines rejoined the staff in 2021. He just couldn't stay away. His new role is a slimmed down version of his position as chief economist, which he held for five years. And he has more than 35 years of experience in a broad array of professional activities primarily in real estate research and education, urban economics, land use analysis and development, and project risk assessment. He has worked ex extensively with major corporations, developers, investors, financial institutions, and government and agencies across the country. Dr. Gaines earned his BBA and MA and PhD, lots of uh, acronyms there, degrees at the University of Georgia, in March of 2019, Dr. Gaines participated as one of three delegates to represent Texas Realtors at MIPM in Cannes, France. Uh, we will be hearing from our Central Texas favorite economist, Dr. Jim Gaines, later in our program. But first up, we want to kick it off with Jessica. So Jessica, come on up. Tell us what you're seeing in consumer trends and factors that are changing in the real estate landscape. It is great to be with you guys. I, I saw the existing home sales numbers this morning, and I know that Dr. Gaines is going to be presenting a lot on your local market um, and what is happening in the state of Texas and what the actual macro economy is doing. I will say, being in on the press conference this morning uh, with the existing home sales, uh, we are starting to see some gains there, and we are starting to see uh, some improvement in the numbers. In the last few months, um, they were essentially flat. And a lot of the reason why is there's just no inventory in the market. And so I think the bottom line here is how are buyers navigating the market? It's a difficult situation. It's incredibly difficult in your local market. And I know the Dr. Gaines will go into details on that, but just on a national scale for every listing that's out there on a national scale, homes are selling within 17 days. And we're talking even rural properties um, in small towns. So really this is very widespread, the tight inventory market. And also we know that for every every home that's listed on a national scale, they're getting four offers. And that's probably laughable in your market. Uh, probably you're receiving much more than that. Um, those details I, I don't personally have, but it is very hard. And what has happened with that is that home prices are increasing at such a rapid pace that we're unfortunately leaving a lot of buyers out of the market. And so that's what I'm going to talk about first is the uneven recovery that we're seeing today is really buyers being left out of the market. And then I'm going to go into who is able to enter today's housing market because it is so hard to be able to navigate when 23% of buyers are paying all cash. Um, that is a very difficult market for buyers to be able to enter. What we do see is as a result, our first time home buyers who would traditionally make up 40% of the market are only at 31%. And we actually have not seen anywhere close to that number since the first time home buyer tax credit back in 2008 and 2010. Now there's some fodder right now that there could be a $15,000 down payment assistance uh, for first time home buyers today. And that would be incredible, except there's no inventory to get them into the market. And this is really a hard thing um, because what we know is that their first time home buyers are having a hard time saving for a down payment especially with high student loan debt loads. Um, and so there are a lot of headwinds for these home buyers, not just the low inventory and affordability of homes, but also being able to just save for that down payment. 
That being said, the inventory crisis is absolutely impacting these buyers on, on a very, very difficult way. Um, what we do see is that when we look back at the last time it was as low of a share for first time buyers, it was back when we had double digit interest rates. Um, so a very different home buying environment where today we have rates that are just below 3% for a 30 year fix. That's an incredible rate. And so what we do see is there's a lot of vacation buyers who are jumping into the market, a lot of investors, whether they're mom and pop investors or institutional investors, we see them jumping in because they can. Um, and we really do see really wealthy buyers jumping into this market because they have the ability to compete. Um, and so first time home buyers are really losing out. All right, so let's talk about some of this data by race. Um, what we are seeing when we talk about the homeownership rate by race, and so this is the rate overall, not just buyers who jumped in last year, but someone who could have owned their home for a very long period of time. What we see here for the homeownership rate is that that rate is incredibly wide. And it has widened actually in recent years. We actually see that the, the gap between uh, white Americans and black Americans is as wide today as when the Fair Housing Act started back in 1968. Um, that rate is very persistent. We know that there's a lot of reasons behind why this is happening. Um, some of those reasons have to do with down payments. Some of them have to do with generational wealth transfers that are being left out here. Um, some of it has to do with, we know there was an artificial push uh, for, for Black and Hispanic Latino home ownership back in the boom years. And we know that individuals were targeted for really bad loan products that were 0% down balloon payment loans um, that really they did lose their homes at double the rate that we saw for white Americans. And that lost home ownership translated into a lot of lost housing wealth for those individuals, but also for their families and generations coming after, um, as we know that that happened as well. So this is a very short time frame. I am glossing over this in a very short slide here, but I'm doing this on purpose because I do wanna show you some of the data that we have been working with in our latest snapshot the report that we put out just a couple months ago um, that goes into this in detail. Some of this detail actually goes on a state level basis. And what we actually were able to do is take ACS census data and look at the homeownership rate on a state level. And so what we did see is that for white Texans within the state of Texas, 67% of them do own a home of their own. Um, that is a, a very solid share. And we can see that there's quite some variation here on the map. Minnesota, very strong homeownership rate for uh, white Minnesotans. I was just there this last week, so I'm, I'm pulling them out at 76%. Um, but in comparison, if we're gonna compare this here, for, for Black individuals within the state of Texas, we know that the homeownership rate is just 40%. Now, this is not as low as what we do see in some states, um, but it is still a very large gap and still a very persistent gap within that state of Texas, um, within your state. So we, we do know that that state, um, that, that gap with the homeownership rate does exist within your state. Um, it is narrower in some states um, and, and wider in others, not to pick on North Dakota, but really that is the one that stands out the most. Um, the homeownership rate for black individuals within the state of North Dakota is just 5%. Um, so taking a hundred folks in North Dakota and a hundred folks in Texas who are Black, um, you do see that just five of them in North Dakota would own their home compared to 40 in Texas. So it's an apples to apples comparison when we're looking at this map. Um, so I want to go into some of the reasons and what the recent experience is for individuals with um, who did just purchase a home. Now, this is national data that what we have seen, this is from our profile of home buyers and sellers. Um, and what we have seen here is that the experience for successful home buyers is very different. The demographics are very different when we do look at the experience and the finances of black home buyers compared to white home buyers overall on a national scale. What we do see is that for black African American home buyers, they are twice as likely to have student loan debt. Um, when we look at the actual dollar amount, they actually have a higher dollar amount as well. We also see uh, that we know that this is a big hurdle to saving for a down payment. Um, but one of the other things that we, we picked up in the data is we actually see that double the share of black home buyers, African-American home buyers who successfully purchased a home in the last year are single females. 
um, compared to white home buyers. And what that really means when we're talking about this affordability crisis is the ability to have two incomes, to be able to compete with those all cash buyers, to be um, in an equal playing field. And unfortunately, we know in this country um, that's, that women do traditionally make less than men. And so that's going to be less buying power. And as home buyers, we know that they have less income as men as well as single male buyers. Uh, we've seen that historically in the data. The other thing that we see here is that African-American buyers are more likely to be single income households. So um, again, having less buying power, unable to compete with a married couple perhaps or an unmarried couple in the market or even roommates who are purchasing together. The other big thing that I think is really important when we look at this data is where is that down payment coming from? Because we know that um, some buyers have a leg up, they can use mom and dad. The bank of mom and dad is a very good place for down payment for some buyers, but what we do see for Black African-American buyers is that 15% of them, one in six, were actually uh, tapping their 401k for a down payment, um, which further erodes the wealth gap uh, when we do think about where are you building your wealth and where are you saving your money. Traditionally, it is the home. Um, but what we do see here is some pretty big implications if folks are taking money from their 401k, a place where they would build wealth, um, and and tapping that as a loan. Uh, in comparison, just 5% to, of white successful home buyers did that. The other thing we see here is there's a higher share of multi-generational buyers for Black African-American buyers. Now, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. If people are pooling their funds within that household, that's a fantastic thing because perhaps that means a bigger home, um, splitting utility costs or food costs or that mortgage. Um, but if that is perhaps an older relative who's retired, a young adult who doesn't have employment right now, that could be a harder point on that finances as well. And then lastly, I think the really important point here and something that um, really needs to be underscored and has been backed up with plenty of academic research that's out there is looking at rejection rates for mortgages. And what we have seen here is that the rejection rate for Black African-American buyers who successfully did end up purchasing their home, they have their keys, they have the Facebook photo to prove it with their agent. Um, it's a very exciting day their denial rate for mortgages is two and a half times what it is for white buyers. And so that really underscores a lot of systemic issues within the home buying process because these are successful home buyers. These are folks who qualify for a mortgage, have a low debt to income ratio, are able to buy a home with these very tight credit standards, but unfortunately were denied during that process. So what does this all mean? What does this all break down to? Why am I spending so much time on this? Um, one, it's a very strong priority of NAR to be looking at this, be cognizant of this. Um, there are recent programs called Fair Haven that's out there that is free. And I highly encourage any agent out there to participate in those programs. But the other reason why is this really erodes family net worth and wealth essentially in this country. Homeownership is where we build our wealth. It is incredibly important. Um, we know that we are very bad savers in the US. Um, and when we get our paycheck, we're not necessarily always going first to savings. Um, so really how we do build our wealth, especially with the recent gains and home prices and equity is really through our home. And so when we look at the net worth of individuals and families within the US, what we do see is that for white families, the net worth is uh, above $188,000, uh, close to one hundred ninety, dollars compared to just $24,000 for Black African-American families. Um, so that gap is very, very persistent um, and something that has widened as we have seen home prices increase and equity in homes increase as well. Um, so savings have increased through homeownership. Um, when we look at this and we just back up and we just look at the net worth of only renters compared to owners, um, what we do see here is this gap is very persistent and the net worth has widened as well. So if we see uh, for owners, the net worth is above 250,000 um, and compared to renters where it's just over uh, $6,000 at 6,300. I'm very sorry, if you see my cat, this is Ray. I'm very sorry, she is joining for this presentation today. Um, very interested in this data, obviously. Um, so, all right, let's talk about some of these changes that are happening um, on the buyers who are entering the market today. Um, what we do see is that buyers are changing their search. They have higher incomes, they're buying at higher price points, um, and they are changing the way that they are buying homes. 
Um, one of the things that I think is very interesting that we're collecting data now on, on a monthly basis actually, is how many buyers are actually purchasing this home site unseen. It's actually 10%. And that I think is an incredible number. We had no reason to look at this data pre-pandemic. And now we see with very tight inventory and people buying longer distances away because of the ability to work remote, because of the flexibility that buyers have now to take their laptop to a vacation home and make that a work home, um, we see that folks are, are really trusting their agent, trusting their realtor out there to be able to help them navigate that transaction and do it without actually physically stepping foot inside that home. I think that's an incredible change that we've seen. The other change that we have seen is a change in behavior and intention of that home. We see that buyers are expecting to own that home for just 10 years, still a decade, it's still a long period of time, but it's not as long as what we have seen in the past where it was just where it was 15 years. That's a very long period of time and the highest that we've recorded it back in our data set. Um, so a big change here during the pandemic where buyers are saying, I need a home for right now, I don't necessarily need my forever home. The other thing that we're seeing is that buyers are looking at fewer homes. Part of that is there's just fewer homes on the market. We've seen in the last month that inventory has gone up a little, but it's not where we need it to be. It's not a balanced market. It's not what I have read Gain say, uh, 6.5 months is what I have seen him cite. Um, uh, what we have now is about 2.4, 2.5 months of supply. And I, I suspect in Austin, it's even lower because that is a very hot market. And I'm sure I'll learn more about that soon. Um, so buyers are seeing fewer homes because there's just fewer homes to see. So let's talk about some of the generational trends. Let's start some generational warfare here. What we see is that millennials with all of the puns and things attached to them about avocado toast and expensive cappuccinos, they are the largest segment of buyers. Um, they are now turning 40. Um, I am one of them, which has been called a geriatric millennial or an elderly millennial. Um, I will say, yes, I have lower back pain. Yes, I am turning 40 this month, um, but ouch. Uh, so this is a new term for millennials because yes, we are getting older. Um, but I have to say millennials have a very large generation. It spans all the way to the mid twenties up to 41 years of age. And so that is a very, very big span. Um, they are the largest segment of buyers. Many of them, the older millennials, they're actually on their second home. Many of them have children in their home. Many of them are married, so they're not ruining all these things, but I will talk about some of that data. The other segment out there that is the huge generation are boomers. Boomers are the largest segment of sellers. They are holding a lot of the wealth in the country. They have the wealth. Um, through home ownership, and they are holding on to it. Um, when they talk about moving and when they talk about selling, they're not actually downsizing. They want to be close to friends and family. They want to be close to their grandkids, but they don't actually want a smaller space. And that I think it becomes a very interesting, complicated mess, really, when we talk about millennials who do have kids in their homes and do need a larger home as well. So Gen Xers, uh, those of you out there, yes, I purposely skipped you. You're used to being skipped. All the memes skip you. It just has Gen Zers, Millennials now, and Boomers. It doesn't even count Gen Xers, that small generation wedged in the middle. Um, Gen Xers out there, I am sorry. I'm going to tell you a lot of depressing data and a lot of hardship out there that you're, you're feeling right now. Gen Xers are a small generation. They're wedged between the two mammoths. Um, they are likely the highest income earners. They are at the peaks of their career. They also have the most financial pressure. Um, they are the most likely generation to be purchasing a multi-generational home. 18% of Gen Xers purchased a multi-generational home last year, 18%. That is a very, very large segment of that population buying a multi-generational home. And I'm going to go into detail on what that means and how that's changed, but that is a large segment. The other thing that we see for Gen Xers is that they are the most likely generation to have bought their home during the boom, the most likely to have lost it, the most likely to have been underwater in it. As a buyer, they take a long period of time. They got to assess it out. They got to really figure out if this is the right home. If I get stuck here for a number of years, longer than I expected to be, am I going to be happy with this home? So they're probably being a little wary based on their past experience coming back into home ownership 
after perhaps having a distressed sale. So as a buyer, I, I think this is an interesting generation. A lot of financial pressures for this generation. Um, similar to those old elderly millennials with their canes, um, similar to them uh, hitting 40 years old, uh, probably more in line there than with the younger millennials for sure. All right, so let's move on and talk about multi-generational buying. This segment is one to watch. I think this is a sticky trend. I suspect in Austin, you guys actually have a higher share of this, um, uh, or at least in Texas as a whole. And the reason why I say that is for um, uh, Latino uh, families, for Hispanic families, uh, for Asian American and for Black American families, we see uh, multi-generational buying at higher rates. And I know that your uh, state is ethnically and racially diverse, um, more so than what we see as a nation as a whole. Uh, so I suspect that you have more multi-generational buying happening within the state. What we did see during COVID is there was a ramping up of multi-generational buying. It increased from 11% pre-pandemic to 15%, which equates to one in six buyers purchasing a multi-generational home. We see the main driver of this is for aging parents to now be in that household. Um, a lot of that has to do with COVID, concerns about the virus being in assisted living or a nursing home, living independently and being lonely. Um, so these aging adults are now in this home. The other thing that we see here is caregiving. Um, and caregiving goes both ways, both for those aging adult relatives, but also because daycares were closed and schools were closed. And that became a very big complication for working parents. And if they weren't closed, perhaps they were hybrid or going in some model where it was cut hours. So that could be very difficult for parents to be able to go to work and have cut arrows for daycare. And so what we did see is these aging parents came into the home to be able to lend a helping hand because that's an extra adult uh, who can help, help with Zoom school if, that, if that's the, the reason uh, or just be there as an extra body. Um, so we do see that, that that is definitely happening. The other reason we really saw this increase is for cost savings. It's expensive to buy a home right now. Home prices have increased at record rates in the last couple of months. Um, and so we do see that people are pooling their money to buy a larger home, to cut that mortgage expense, uh, but also cut utilities, cut food costs, uh, and be able to pool incomes together and buy this larger single family home. The other change that we saw is for young adults. They are living at home at a record share. Um, at least they were back in the fall, uh, which is quite a while from now. Um, but what we had seen is the largest share of young adults at 52% who were living at home since the Great Depression. Um, that statement is quite extraordinary. Um, there's a lot of reasons behind that. We do know that colleges went online, they went a hybrid method. College students decided to take a gap year. Um, because they didn't want to go back to college or they didn't want to do hybrid and waste the money on it, thought they wanted to actually go into college themselves um, in person. And so we saw that that really uh, was a driver for staying home. We also know that there's a lot of young adults who are renting in city centers who said, I don't want to do this right now. I can just move home uh, where there's a fully stocked fridge, freezer, move back to my home bedroom um, and, and may have moved home there. And then there was a lot of job losses and those job losses were really uh, focused on young adults. We saw higher share of young adults losing their jobs uh, during the COVID crisis. And so they went home as well. I say all of this because I think right now what we are seeing and what early data is indicating, I do not have hard data on this, is that record share of young adults at home, I think they are emptying the nest a second time. Um, we are hear hearing that rental prices are going up. Um, this month's data released today saw some indication that first-time home buyers are back in the market, uh, perhaps slightly larger shares being able to compete right now with more inventory, slightly more inventory. And so we may see this re-emptying of a nest essentially moving out of these multi-generational homes, out of parental units, um, where they've been able to save for a down payment for the last year and chalk away that money, giving them that advantage, paying down that student loan debt, and now perhaps are entering the housing market. So this is an interesting one to watch. All right, birth rates. Birth rates are at a hundred year low. Um, early in the pandemic, we expected this baby boom to happen. People thought it would be a couple of weeks. Uh, we'd be home for a couple of weeks and there'd be this big baby boom. There was not. 
Um, birth rates actually fell 4% last year. They had continued falling um, about 2% every year before that. So really this is a continuation of a massive trend of a drop in birth rates. Some of this has to do with those geri geriatric millennials um, who graduated during the Great Recession, had a very hard financial situation, um, couldn't find great employment, and so decided not to have kids. Um, it also has to draw, do with a drop in marriage rates, which I will go into shortly, um, but this is impacting home buying. And it, we very much see this trend when we look at home buyers. Um, recent home buyers who have a kid in their household has dropped to 33%. At a peak in 1985, it was at 58%. This is kids under the age of 18 in a home for recent home buyers. Um, this absolutely impacts what a buyer wants in a home and how they're gonna use that home. Um, and so what we have seen is that those extra bedrooms, the school district, quality of the schools, all of those things become back burner issues if you don't have a kid or you don't expect to have a kid in that house. Um, now I'm seeing comments in the chat. Um, I'm not reading them, um, but I know we're gonna address Q&A later and I always get questions on this issue. So I'm excited to dive deeper into it, but I'm gonna kind of leave it for right here because I, I have a couple more topics to get through, uh, but there's a lot of reasons why we're seeing this drop in birth rates and I'm excited to dive into it if there are questions on that. All right. so. The other impact, um, if you are seeing my cat just literally lay here um, on my desk right now, and I have uh, others in the room, these are all of my animals in my house. We have four cats and a dog because we're crazy. Um, what we do see is that, yes, we are crazy, but there's a lot of crazy people right now with all these animals. Um, a lot of them adopted during the pandemic. People wanted companionship and they wanted something to do that wasn't on a screen um, and they had time to actually train a pet. Uh, so what we do see is pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, this is an influencer for where people are buying and what they're buying. For young millennial buyers, so that youngest generation, that youngest cohort of millennial buyers, a third of them choose their neighborhood because of their pet. <laughs> I kid you not, the pet is choosing the neighborhood, truly. They want good walking trails. They want good hikes to go on. They want uh, good dog parks a fenced yard if they can't have all of those things. So the, the pet is really the driver. Wide window sills, a catio, whatever it is, the, the pet is the driver. Um, we do see this as important in rural areas and in urban areas. I suspect it's important for, for uh, buyers in your area as well. We've seen the cost of a dog in the last year go up 150%. So when we talk about home prices going up 23, 24% year over year, the cost of a dog has gone up 150%. Um, so really seeing importance placed on pets right now. The cost of a cat has gone up like 40%. That's crazy because they just ruin your furniture. I don't know why. Um, so that, that is very much an important factor. Okay, so let's talk marriage. <laughs> the birth rates have dropped. They're at a hundred year low, but marriage rates, they're also dropping. Um, back when we look back at the 1960s, when 70% of American adults were married, Today, just half of American adults are married. This is a trend among first-time home buyers that I'm showing you here because this is where we can really see that trend pronounced, reflected in the data. When we look at first-time home buyers and the household composition, we really can see that back in the 80s, nearly there were 75% of buyers were married, and today just a little over half of first-time home buyers are married. There are some big implications here because we know that a married couple is gonna have more buying power. They're going to be able to compete in the market more um, <coughs> and be able to actually be able to enter the market at a higher rate because they do have that buying power. What we have seen um, during COVID um, is that there has been an increase with housing affordability as well, but also I think that was because of companionship an increase in unmarried couples and roommates who are purchasing homes together. Now, this had been a trend a couple of years ago as well. We've seen an acceleration in these buyers, and I think it's because people are pooling their money to be able to purchase a home together, but also because perhaps they were renting together and they said, you know what, why don't we just go and buy a home? But this is an acceleration in that trend. We have seen that single female buyers can continue to be a force in the market. We see them at 19% of first-time home buyers. They're about 
18, 19% of all home buyers overall repeat as well. Uh, so we do see that they are active in the market, uh, but the share has gone down. And I think that has a little to do with buying power, a little to do with income rather than perhaps their want to be in the home. The other thing that we see here is agent use. Uh, so let's talk some about that. Um, we do see that buyer's use of agents is near all-time highs. Um, people really do want an agent by their side. They want representation. They, they may be using technology. They may be searching online, but they want an agent to help them find that home. What we do see is that the highest use of agents is actually by the youngest buyers. Um, they are nervous. They have a lot of anxiety. They've never done this before. And first-time home buyers absolutely want someone to help them negotiate uh, and to really find that perfect home for them. Uh, two things that are very, very hard to do. Um, and, and we do see agents coming in to help with that. Um, we also see on the selling side uh, that sellers want an agent, but they also want a full service agent. 89% of all sellers used an agent in the last year, just 8% used uh, for sale by owner and just try to do it themselves. Uh, but only half of those are actually real FISBOs. Um, the other half are actually selling to a friend or a neighbor. It's, an, it's a transaction that happened where it's really just an arm's length transaction because they know that person. Um, we do ask a follow-up question here and we ask what type of agent do you use? in that transaction. And what we found is that uh, the highest share of them in the last decade of sellers in the last decade actually used a full service agent. They very much want someone who's gonna help them um, and really be by their side before that home is ever listed for sale all the way past when that home actually goes to the closing table, following up with them with contractors, um, really helping them with all of the bread and butter of selling that home within the correct time frame, pricing it correctly, making sure they find a qualified buyer for that home, but also how do I fix up my home for sale? I've lived in this for a long period of time. I know there's problems with it. I know that everyone's been binge watching HGTV. How do I actually fix up this home for sale? So those are the top things that people really do want from an agent. We have asked the question about iBuyers. If people are using an iBuyer, we found it was zero, it was 0%. So it's less than 1%. Um, it is not a measurable share um, of people using iBuyers. Um, people just don't wanna take that price discount, which is quite large um, and, and feel comfortable doing that. All right, so what's next? What's around the corner? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I will say, I suspect there will be a drop in tenure. Um, this is a big question mark though. We know that people have been in their home for a long period of time. Um, it used to be that historically people moved every six to seven years. There's a hangover effect from the Great Recession and people decided, you know what, I want to stay in my home for a longer period of time. I've also locked in these very low interest rates. I bought perhaps a larger home because I bought in a suburban area or a small town seeking affordability and also the space and the ability to work remote. Um, but we do know that 10 year and home has gone up to a high of 10 years. I suspect that this may go down, uh, but I don't know for sure. And I think that's a big question mark about what, what's next there. Other changes to watch for, what keeps a vacation home with good broadband access from being a primary home? I think this is one to keep an eye out on. We know there's a lot of vacation buyers in this market and <laughs> taking advantage of these low interest rates and saying, yeah, let me buy a second home. So I think that's a big question mark. Um, our first time home buyer is gonna have a chance to rebound. They lived at home for the last year. If they're renters, um, I don't know. I think this is an interesting one to watch, especially with low interest rates. If there's more inventory to come into the market, perhaps. <clears throat> Early retirement purchases. We know that buyers are there who think that retirement is 10, 15 years off but they're buying their retirement purchases now. This is one to watch, especially I think in your guys' market. We know there's a lot of young adults who've moved to Austin, but there's a lot of people who wanna be close to their grandkids. Um, so I think that this is one to watch if you may have some, some boomers moving into that market saying, you know what, I, I'm essentially uh, want, moving to this area so that I can be close to my kids, but also the grandkids. And then is there gonna be more inventory coming to the market? I hope that Gaines goes over this and gives us some positive information. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Lastly here, 
here is our housing and economic forecast. Um, I will say this has not been revised since May. We do revise it on a quarterly basis, um, expecting strong sales for the rest of the year with home prices continuing to go up. We also expect, Lawrence expects, Lawrence Yoon, our chief economist, expects that the year and 30 year fixed mortgage interest rate um, as of this morning at the press conference will be 3.5%, not 3.2. Um, the unemployment rate continuing to tick down as states have reopened. Um, and people feel confident going back to work and daycares reopen and GDP ending the year positive. Um, please join us on Monday. I saw it promoted as well in your highlights reel. We do have a free forecast summit going over global. It's in the afternoon. It's 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it is completely free. So please do join us. And thank you guys so much for having me today. I'm excited to hear Dr. Gaines. All right, Jessica, the data is so compelling. I, I want to say one thing that jumped out to me was it's super encouraging that 89% of sellers want a full service agent. So we look forward to having you join us for the Q&A session. I want to remind everybody that's joining us this, this afternoon, it's not the morning, this afternoon, to please post your questions in the chat box or any comments you have, and we will try our best to address them. Uh, but up next, let's welcome Dr. Gaines. Please join us on screen and we'll have you share your screen and take it from here. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm very flattered of your kind comments about me uh, being so popular. I, I didn't realize that I'd have been here on sooner. Uh, I, it, that was a fascinating pro uh, process and, and discussion. I really uh, enjoyed it a great deal. And here's where, here's where we're going. I've got good news and bad news here interspersed in, in all of this. I can tell you that the good news more than outweighs the, the bad news because most of the bad stuff is, is a matter of, we're just not sure how it's gonna look here into the going forward into 2022 and into 2023 even. Uh, so we'll have to just see how this is going to, to work itself out. Now, the $64 question is, there we go. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the economy and, and what's happening and what's coming and so forth. And it's all based on getting, creating more jobs, more income and more consumption. Uh, the, the basic underlying truth of the US and, and really the global economy is it's all predicated on all of us going out and spending our money. I mean, if you want to be a patriot today, you need to be spending at least 110% of your take home pay and contribute to the overall economic growth of the country. Well, that'll, that'll come along. The other thing that's also true, everything I'm going to tell you here this afternoon and everything that we're going to talk about in terms of economic growth or prosperity completely is dependent on uh, getting the COVID and the pandemic under control. And we thought we were doing a pretty good job of that until this Delta variant came along. And now there's a Lambda uh, coming along behind that. And if uh, I'm sure all of you are seeing the news here, but within the last 30 days, uh, it, it looks like maybe we don't have it as much under control as what we originally thought and were, were hopeful for. So uh, understand that everything uh, is dependent on that. We, we started, uh, we peaked actually, and I'll show you. Yeah, I'm a, an economist. You know there's graphs and charts coming. Uh, but you know that uh, we peaked back in January uh, in terms of COVID cases and all of the impact and so forth. And then in late January, early February started the vaccination program, and it had a major, major impact on the whole COVID experience and the number of reported cases, the number of deaths and so forth. And we're still seeing how that's going to play out. We've, we seem to have hit a plateau in terms of the percentage of people getting vaccinated, and that's, that's causing us some economic concern. But nevertheless, we also had significant major physical stimulus. The government the federal government has spent in the last uh, almost year and a half, they've pumped nearly $3 trillion into our economy. 
mostly in just direct checks and payments, supplements to unemployment claims and insurance and so forth uh, to try to fuel the economy. It's been called stimulus payments. Quite frankly, it, it'd be better labeled as survival uh, payments. Without that money coming out, uh, things would have been a lot more dire, would have been a lot worse than what we experienced anyway. Uh, the, the benefits of, of that $3 trillion, though, have not been nearly as uh, significant or as, as, as much statistically as what we had hoped for. And the reason being is the, the consumption. I was talking about the expenditures. Uh, a lot of people got the money and didn't spend it or haven't spent it as much. And so it hasn't had the same kind of kick into the uh, economy as what we'd hoped for. We'll see how that's going. As you know, it all gives out by the end of this month. And there, now the question is going to be what the impact is going to be of the end of these fiscal stimulant uh, payments and, and what it's going to mean to the economy in terms of uh, rent evictions. We know the eviction moratorium uh, may, may give out as well. I mean, isn't it amazing to you that the CDC has a, has a rent moratorium or eviction moratorium? I mean, what the CDC has to do with housing, uh, that was a political expedient uh, thing. Anyway, uh, we're looking for some increased spending. We've got, a, we do have the increased demand coming from savings. Uh, the savings rate expanded during the pandemic in the last 12 months. Uh, basically from around six or seven percent savings rate to at one point close to 40 percent savings rate. And that has helped some of the first time buyers, some of the younger millennials and so forth, who were maybe postponing buying a house, that decision, postponing it uh, two or three years in order to save up the down payment. Well, by saving it sooner, it accelerated. And with the lower interest rates, what we've seen is a lot of the demand that might have shown up in 2022, maybe even out to 2023, has been brought forward here to now. And, and we're seeing that show up in the, in the increased sales and the demand figures. Supply, supply chain and inventory problems, we're going to talk about that all along. Uh, there's a shortage of, of everything. And it's not only that the materials are short, you can't get delivery even if the materials are available because of the uh, hang up in the logistics and supply chain of, of literally transporting whatever it may be, lumber, for example, from point A to point B, because we don't have enough truck drivers, we don't have enough trucks on the road and so forth and so on. Come back to that point a little later. The Fed has already indicated monetary policy is almost off the table. Uh, they're going to keep the short-term Fed funds rate at about where it is, which is between zero and a half a point, you'll see my graph. Like I say, I got a graph coming a little later on. We showed it at a quarter of a percent. Uh, it's going, they're finding though, it's going to be harder here the second half of this year and on into 2022 to keep the rates down. Uh, I'll tell you how they're gonna do that in just a little bit. And then of course, the, here's the biggie, here's the biggie. Uh, Inflation, people are getting nervous about inflation. Economists are getting nervous about it. We're watching what it's doing. We anticipated that as we had economic recovery from the basically the government induced shutdown of during the pandemic, and then now we're opening up and pe telling people to go back to work, telling people they can drive, go to a restaurant, go spend money some more. Well, we expected that to create a surge in prices and so forth, which is the surge or the temporary uh, increase in inflation. And indeed, that's coming to pass. I'll show you that in a minute. What we don't know is if that's going to continue on out or if it's going to be a, a blip on a curve and, and come back down as the, as the economy uh, uh, gets a little bit more settled. Here's what the GDP looks like. You can see that the first quarter was up 6.4, second quarter, best to guess, uh, we're looking probably for something around uh, seven, seven and a half percent. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I was interested in, in the NAR projection on GDP. I think they had it up 6% for the year there, as I saw it. I tell you, I, you can read all kinds of economic reports around, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Lautz will agree with me on this. 
and, and it ranges from here to there and back again uh, of what e economists are saying. Because I can tell you right now, none of us have a clue. <laughs> I mean, the honest answer is we don't have a real clue on all this. We, the, the, the economy has never experienced what we've experienced the past year. We've never had this kind of mandated shutdown that lasted for almost a year from, from last March to this March. Uh, it, it just hadn't happened before with, with complete shutdown. Uh, various industries like the, the uh, airline industry, the restaurant, uh, hotels, all kinds of personal services industries that basically were told to just shut down. You can't, you're not allowed to see anybody or talk to anybody or at least be close to them. Heck, that's why we're still doing this on Zoom. And, and here we are trying to forecast, well, what does it mean when we do kind of open up again? And it's, and it's going to be ups and downs and, and this and that and the other. So I can tell you that all of these uh, estimates are, are just that. They're, they're not estimates, they're guesstimates. Uh, we don't really know uh, what the heck is going on. Here's, here's uh, what I'd like to show you. Here's the trends in the US daily COVID case. These are seven day moving averages. So that's the reason it's a little bit smoother looking as any of you who've been following this, you know, on a day to day basis goes up and down. That put your eye on the on the far right hand side of the blue line and the, and the orange line for that matter. That's the number of reported cases and then of course reported deaths. And, and what you see is this tick up, uh, tick up. Uh, it's not a hiccup, it's a tick up uh, that's going up. And, and this has got most of us pretty nervous who are trying to look at the economy and saying, okay, uh, is this gonna be temporary? Kind of like what we saw this past March when, when we did start reopening. Yeah, we had this tick up, you can see it back there, but then it, it came back down again as the vaccinations became uh, greater and greater and greater and the, the decline in the reported cases. Um, and now we can see it coming back up again. We're just not sure uh, what that's going to imply. And, and there's the uncertainty and something for you to, to watch out. Uh, I get asked the question, what do we know or when will we know we're actually recovered? Well, I'll tell you when we're gonna be recovered is when that orange line comes back up to the same level as where the blue line was. Uh, total non-farm employment. We're still about, well, when, if you, there's two ways to look at, it. we're still 5% too low or we're 95% recovered, but we still got nearly 7 million jobs that were lost. We lost over 20 million jobs uh, back last uh, April and May of last year. And we have not recovered those 20 million jobs. 20 million people lost their jobs, disappeared, got laid off, what have you, uh, and so forth. And there's still nearly 15 million people uh, claiming some kind of unemployment. They're, they're different now unemployment claims. Uh, some that are pandemic related, some are just standard and so forth. But the, the grand total is something like this. So it, this gives you an idea. We had about 152 and a half million jobs going. Now we've got about 146 million. We're still, we're still short in terms of coming back and replacing all those people that lost their jobs. Here's what I was talking about, the inflation. And you can see how both the blue line and the orange line, the orange line is the headline CPI, the consumer price index. And that you can see it was, it's, it's very volatile. You can see how it moves around so much. And I carried it back to uh, 08, back before the Great Recession. And you can see the big dip that it took there in the Great Recession and actually went negative uh, back in 09 and 10. Uh, but you can see how out here on the far right, since the first of this year, since January of this year, and we started trying to reopen the economy, we started getting the the vaccination program in. Uh, we saw the decline in the, in the COVID and people got a little bit more, a, a lot more optimistic in and going up and people got out and started buying things. Uh, goods were being bought, things, things were being bought, groceries were being bought, uh, uh, so forth. But what we discovered was services were not. Uh, airline travel, hotels, entertainment, uh, you name it, uh, going to the barbershop, uh, all of those kinds of things, the spas, 
uh, the gymnasiums, anything that involved personal services went down. Well, now that's picking back up. And incidentally, the services spending is about twice the goods spending in our national economy. So while goods spending was we had recovered first, we needed that services spending to really start jumping. Well, it has, and the prices are coming up. The core, of course, is that CPI minus food and energy. You got to know the gasoline prices have been going all over the place and the price of oil. Talk about that in just a second. Anyway, uh, the other thing that you got to watch out for, and I'm as an economist I, and, and about the uh, economy, and particularly when I get over here and start talking about the real estate market here in just a minute, you need to know uh, that year over year comparisons here are going to be totally phony <laughs> because 2020 was such a weird year. Uh, trying to compare what's going on this month, this year, compared to the same month last year, you're not really comparing apples to apples. So the year over year comparisons uh, are not completely uh, reliable. Here's what's going on. Anybody in real estate, of course, needs to know about interest rates. Uh, the, the interest rates, uh, you can see the green line, that's the federal funds rate. That's, I was mentioning that a minute ago. The, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to keep that rate down at that same uh, 0.25 is how I, I plotted it, effectively uh, zero. Uh, the, the blue line there is the 10-year Treasury rate. That was the rate that we thought was going to increase, and you can see that it did. Uh, earlier in the year and late last year, it was down less than 1%. In fact, bordering on a half of a percent, which was just astronomically low uh, for that rate. It came back up and got into the, the 1% uh, level. I think this morning I looked at it, it's running about 1.2%, something in that vicinity. Uh, and and that the reason that rate's important because generally that's the benchmark for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And that's the black line there at the top. And interestingly, uh, it's, been, it's been real resilient uh, to any kind of increase. Uh, it's been right at the 3% plus or minus, uh, say two and three quarter to three and one quarter uh, percent level. And there's a 50 basis point spread uh, depending on who you talk to and, and, and the lender you deal with and, and how your buyers or uh, what their credit rating is and the income and so forth. But it's in that 3%. And, and so, you know, the interest rate is still uh, a very attractive come on for home purchases. It is one of the reasons why house demand, home demand, home buying demand has stayed as high and as strong as it has. And I got to tell you again, we, we don't really know, but the best guess is that it's going to stay in this same general level, probably for the rest of this year, uh, 2022 on in maybe to the first quarter. Again, it'll depend a little bit on what the Fed does. And it won't be so much what the Fed does with that green line down there. It's going to be what the Fed does in terms of buying uh, treasury bonds and treasury notes and uh, mortgage-backed securities. Right now, the Fed it is the secondary market. It, it's, the, it's the buyer of the Ginnie Mae, uh, the Freddie Mac, the Fannie Mae bonds that they use in order to make and guarantee loans. Uh, and, and as long as the Fed is, is the buyer there and can then dictate the cost, the price of those bonds, which dictates the interest rate that those bonds carry, uh, then that is how the Fed is actually influencing and controlling, if you will, uh, the general level of interest rates, but particularly uh, on the mortgage rate here, which most of us are more most, most involved in. So uh, I get asked the question all the time, when is, the, when is this surge in demand going to, going to go away? And there's, of course, a lot of reasons why it might, but one of them uh, generally that's always cited is when interest rates start going up and when you start seeing major tick ups in the interest rate, then the, you'll start seeing the demand fall off. We just don't see that major increase in the, in the interest rate happening anytime real soon. Uh, I, I just don't believe it will. I've seen several reports here lately when a lot of the so-called experts are predicting that by December, the mortgage interest rate might be three and a half percent. It really looks like that's going to be sticky 
uh, it might happen. Uh, and here again, I'm telling you, most of us don't know. We're having to guess at what we think is going to happen uh, given government program, given general demand, and given global uh, eco economic events and conditions. And remember, right now, globally, the rest of the world is also experiencing uptick in the COVID and so forth, getting very nervous in the global uh, financial markets and the money markets and capital markets. And, and so that's also going to be a hindrance. We just don't have time to go into all the details there. I will point out, I don't want to belabor this one. This is my, this is my downer slide. I said I had good news and bad news. Uh, here's some of the things that you, you can kind of watch out for sort of at a macro level and, and start, you know, just, just be aware of them and, and, and anticipate. I don't, I, Austin's going to get through this in really, really good shape. So it's not the big deal. But the stock market correction collapse, uh, the stock market right now is in pretty good shape on a daily basis. If you watch it, it drives you nuts. But, but uh, you know, we've got a big wealth effect. Uh, people have, have made a lot of money in the stock market. The financial markets and the global economic, I just discussed that. Uh, yield targets, monetary policy, uh, all of this, this activity by the Fed has, has encouraged and actually stimulated the increase in the price of houses, but also the increase in prices of commercial real estate and land. Uh, I can tell you at the Real Estate Research Center, as you well know, we, we monitor rural land in Texas and, and the land market is going just as bonkers as the housing market right now. People are out buying land uh, right and left and, and the land prices are going up, which is going to show up eventually uh, in the housing market as well because the, the people who do land development and have to convert that next hundred acres out down the road into the next subdivision is are, they're having to pay more for the land today than they did a year, two years, three years ago. We just have to see how that goes. The supply chain disruptions and trade and politics, that's, that'll get worked out eventually. You can see it kind of easing a little bit, but it's still there. Uh, the debt correction, debt is the big black uh, cloud on the horizon. The general level of debt, national debt, sovereign debt, and not only for the United States, but all of the countries around the world. Uh, the amount of corporate debt, corporate America has is, is increased its balance sheet on the debt side considerably in the last five, six years because of the cost of the debt has been virtually zip. Uh, and in fact, some of them make money borrowing. They're borrowing money, corporate America is borrowing money to pay back old debt, to buy back stock and to pay dividends. They're actually using it as an operating capital uh, source. Uh, we'll have to see how that all works out. If you're not aware of it, we're coming up to another round here in the next 30 days of having to expand the debt ceiling for the U.S. government. If, as you are all very much aware, uh, the U.S. government has been borrowing money like it knew what it was doing in the trillions of dollars, and we've hit our limit in terms of our legal statutory debt limit of how much we can borrow. Uh, and if we don't expand it, we've had to do this. It comes up regularly. It was two years ago, the last time it came up. Well, guess what? It's back up again on the agenda in the next, I think it's next 30, 45 days. And, the, and of course, all of the political rhetoric has already started about we're going to increase the debt limit. We're not going to increase the debt limit, da, 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 da. Uh, if they don't increase it, then the federal government can't do anything that becomes impotent. And so that's not likely to happen. So we do do have to watch about inflation, debt coverage, and then of course, fiscal policy, uh, taxes and spending. They wanna do the infrastructure bill. Are we gonna increase taxes, not increase taxes? Uh, some of the real estate issues, the 1031 exchange is on the table. Uh, the long-term capital gains tax rate is on the table for anybody who owns. Also the capital gains tax rate on buying and selling or even your principal residence has been discussed of, of lowering uh, the amount that's exempt before you have to pay taxes. So these are all issues that people are going to want to watch and see what's going on. All right, let me get to Texas now. Uh, Texas, of course, we hit a double whammy back in, in 2020. Uh, we had the oil and gas go down in December of 2019. They carried on into the first and second quarter of, the, of 2020. 
And then in March of 2020, boom, on top of everything else, we had the pandemic and the COVID hit. So, so Texas got hit uh, twice. Uh, by and large, the energy impact still is affecting those markets most affected. Midland, Odessa, Victoria, Corpus, Beaumont, Part Arthur, the, the, the areas of Texas that are, that are really energy related uh, and more energy dependent on that industry. Houston, for example, uh, among the major MSAs, far more affected than Austin or Dallas or San Antonio, uh, none of which are really being influenced that much anymore uh, by what happens in the energy sector. So, so we're getting through all of that. Here's what it looks like in Texas. Again, everything COVID control dependent, that's, that's an override, uh, but we are reopening the economy. It's going to take all this year. It's not going to be an overnight situation. We, we've made some pretty good progress here in the last two, three months. Uh, and now we're hitting the second half of the year. This is when we really anticipated the economy really starting to churn uh, because we've just got to get over uh, being shut down, if you will. Job recovery is active. It's been a little sluggish. We're adding jobs. Uh, we're adding jobs, particularly in those industries that got hardest hit, transportation and entertainment and utilities and so on. Uh, uh, we'll have to just see how that works. Construction, yes and no. Uh, residential, yes. Uh, Non-residential, no. So coming, but coming and going. Consumer attitudes and spending, I would, I've already hit on that. Energy, not likely to be a driver. At best, we're looking for energy to be neutral, despite the fact that the energy price of oil of West Texas Intermediate has bounced back up uh, dramatically. I'll show you that in just a minute. But we don't think it's going to have the same kind of economic stimulus uh, and impact on our state's economy or, for that matter, any local economies, except for those those. Uh, communities most affected by that industry uh, in, in, in the coming year, really through 2022. But that's, again, one of those things that we're not real, real sure of. Housing is going to continue to be strong. I'll get to that in a minute. Watch out state and local budgets. Uh, they're, they're, they're under a lot of pressure uh, going on right now. Uh, but the population growth is still continuing. As you know, uh, the, the preliminary 2020 census numbers, or I don't know if they're preliminary, the, the, the first pass uh, of 2020 census numbers have come out. Uh, Texas gained more than 4 million people the last decade. We're just shy of 30 million people in the state. Uh, we, we, don't, we got more people we know what to do with. Uh, I guess that's why we shut down the border. But, but uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. It, 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 but we do have a lot of people, and of course, all of you will testify that it seems like all those 4 million people all came to Austin. And that's the good news and the bad news that you have to put up with. Here's what COVID looks like in Texas. Very similar pattern as the national, is, which is not very surprising. And, and what it indicates to us is it still may not be under control. We still don't really have... Uh, the virus and the and the pandemic completely under control. So we'll have to see how that's going. Weekly claims uh, on the unemployment insurance. This is something, of course, we were watching this closely, more closely a few months ago, uh, over the last six, seven, eight, nine months than we, we really are today. We're, we're approaching being back to the pre-pandemic levels, the right-hand side of the chart looking kind of like the left-hand side of the chart. Uh, and, and, but we're still having uh, quite a bit of activity. Non-farm employment, I showed you that at the national level. Here's what it looks like from the state's level. We're still a, a little over 500,000, almost 600,000 jobs short of being just back to where we were before all this mess started. Uh, we're about 96% recovered, so we're doing a little bit better uh, than, than, uh, uh, than the national. What's interesting is we're, we're 570,000 jobs down but according to the latest report from the Texas Workforce Commission, there are more than 700,000 job openings. So one of, the, one of the fascinating issues right now is getting people to go back to work and getting them back in the, on, the, on the employment rolls. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking for employment probably to go up about 6% from last year. But don't forget, 2020 was a down year. You can see the, the drop in the blue bar there for 2020. So it's 6% up from last year, not 2019. Uh, basically what it's suggesting is 
that we think that by the end of the year, we're going to be just slightly ahead of where we were pre-pandemic uh, using 2019 annual data as our measure there. I mentioned that uh, West Texas Intermediate barrel of oil, price of the barrel of oil has recovered. Uh, it, 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 it approached $75 a barrel here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I looked it up this morning. La this, the past week, it's been in the high 60s. It dropped a little bit, but uh, this morning it was back up to about $71 or $72. It's again, a very volatile kind of thing. The key here is that rig count, the blue line. What you see is it kind of leveling out because what we're discovering is that even though the price of oil is recovering, uh, the, the rig activity and the employment related to the energy sector is not coming back as vigorously or at the same rate. And, and so we're not seeing that same type of energy impact coming into the market. Here is the Texas weekly, weekly leading economic index that we put out at the Real Estate Research Center. Uh, it's, it's on our website. You can go and look at this on a, on a weekly basis. And, and check, and you can see how that the trend is most definitely up. We're, we are looking for a very strong economic recovery uh, coming out of the pandemic, and we think it's going to continue. I, 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 here's the best information I could find on Austin and the COVID, and Austin is looking pretty good. Uh, now, this is a little bit dated data. It stopped at the end of June, uh, so it's not picking up uh, the last 20 days. So, uh, and, and Austin, like the rest of the state, has an uptick that it's going to have to account for, uh, but it's down and paralleling very much what's going on at the state level. Also paralleling is the employment base, only down about 17,000 jobs. Austin has done a remarkable job of recovering. You can see the growth in the job uh, increase is, is uh, sort of leveling out a little bit. We'd like that to pick up a little quicker, uh, down about one and a half percent. So it's about 98 and a half percent recovered. And, but recovered here is just give us back to where we were in February of 20. Uh, forget anything above that. But on an annual basis, we do think that in likelihood, uh, job, in, job growth here at the second half of the year is going to be sufficient to get us up about 4% from where we were in 2020, uh, and which is going to be almost enough or maybe just a little bit greater than where we were in 2019, uh, which at this point, uh, we're going to be, we're going to be pretty good uh, in, in looking at that. Let's, I want to turn some attention to the housing market because that's what I know everybody's interested in. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this. I, I monitor a lot of real estate uh, uh, and housing publications and so forth. This one came out yesterday. Uh, and it, and it, it, this was Housing Wire, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it. Uh, and, and, and all kind of data, uh, existing home sale data came out this morning. Uh, it was still, it was actually positive. It was up, I think, for June, where the previous four or five months had actually been down slightly. Uh, so, uh, and, and quite frankly, I'd, I'd like to point out to you that, that uh, Losing steam is a, is a relative term and probably not altogether bad because we really don't want to have a market where we're dependent on having 15 to 20 percent increases in sales or prices or anything else. That's not really a good economic situation. So losing a little bit of steam isn't all that hard. Here's, uh, here's some interesting things that I think these are the things that I think are going to affect the market the rest of this year and on into next year. Demographics, we've, all, we've heard just an excellent presentation on that and what's going on. Uh, 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 being one of those older boomers, I, I'm one of the other guy, end of the, of the spectrum. You can tell from the color of my hair. Uh, I bought my house. I'm here. I ain't going anywhere. And that's one of the problems. We're aging in place and staying put a lot. Uh, and, and that's, that's affecting that supply. The inventory limited, that's probably the big story in the housing market nationally. It's the big story in the housing market in the state of Texas. And it's a big, big, big part of the story in Austin. Uh, the inventory is limited, especially in the lower price categories for first time buyers. Let me put it this way, in Aggie speak, we ain't got none. 
The, the, there just aren't enough houses listed for sale and available for sale, either existing or new, uh, to bring up. Affordability and price changes. There's some evidence that maybe buyers in the market are getting some price fatigue, uh, that the affordability is, is affecting demand. And people are saying, well, you know, I, this is a peak market. We're at historical highs. I don't know if I want to buy a house at the peak of the market. Uh, well, we'll have to see. And my incomes, the income levels are not picking up. We still have historically low interest rates. The ease of mortgage financing is tightening a little bit. And by ease, uh, that mortgage credit availability. Uh, the last three months, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, overall credit availability index, which you can get online from their website, uh, has actually eased up a little bit, making, making mortgage credit a little bit easier. But this is what's different than what we went through back in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, when money was being thrown out, all the subprime mortgages were being made. Uh, we had, uh, you know, no income, no job, no assets, lend them the money anyway. That, we aren't going through that kind of a period. The, the lending side of the, of the equation has stayed very modest, very moderate and very conservative across the board. So we, we don't seem to have that same level of people who can't really afford a house getting loans to buy a house. So as a result, we're not anticipating big deal of foreclosures and so forth. Yeah, we're gonna get some because people have lost their jobs. And, and you saw a minute ago, we're still 7 million jobs across. We're still 600,000 jobs short here in Texas. So there's going to be some pain. There's gonna be some foreclosures maybe some distress, but not much. The good news here is there's enough equity in the market that people who are in trouble, and here's a here's potential for you guys uh, uh, as agents and brokers, if you know people who are potentially in danger of being foreclosed on, maybe it's a good time to sell. It, it's not a truly voluntary sell, but they could still sell, maintain their credit rating, not have the foreclosure on the record, maybe even make a couple of bucks uh, and, and come back into the market uh, later on when they, they get jobs and so forth. Technology has changed everything and is moving forward. We, you, saw, you heard the discussion about people uh, looking at fewer houses, looking at them online. Uh, we can do everything. You can do everything now without ever seeing the property or seeing another person from, from soup to nuts uh, in buying property. And the technology is only getting more and more uh, uh, pronounced. And then the wealth effect from stock market and, and savings. The Wells Fargo NAHB Home Market Index. The home builders are losing a little bit of steam. Uh, they've got a problem. They've got backlogs. Uh, right now, I know builders even in the Austin area that are saying they're not even signing on new contract work because they've got such a backlog. They haven't started some of the contracts that they've already signed. And incidentally, when you read the data about new home sales, a new home sale is counted as a sale when the contract is signed, not when the closing takes place. So a lot of these new home sales that you're hearing about are sales of homes that haven't even been started yet. They haven't been built yet. And the home builders are having an issue now with that backlog because again of the supply chain, they can't get the materials, they can't get the labor to build the houses fast enough and they can't, they sure as heck couldn't guarantee prices. They, 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 there's no such thing as a fixed cost contract anymore because they have no idea what the costs are going to look like next month. Ne nevertheless, next six, seven, eight, nine months that it might take to build the house. But housing starts, you can see, have been coming up and are doing pretty well. Here's what the Texas housing market, I'm not going to dwell on this. There's, there's two things I want to point out. Look at the, uh, first of all, notice I'm comparing the second quarter of this year to the second quarter of 2019. Second quarter of 2020, throw it out the window, doesn't exist. Uh, from a statistical standpoint, to try to compare what the market's doing, because that was when the pandemic started, the virus started and so forth. So we've got we've we've to look back at 2019. Look at the distribution in 2019, Nearly a third of the Mars sales that took place in Texas, 32.6%, were under $200,000. Today, or this past second quarter, it was less than 20%, it was 19% were less than 200,000. Conversely, about 10% of the market was greater than 500,000, and today it's nearly 20%, it, um, almost 19% greater than 500,000. 
that's the reason it's that distribution shift, if you will, in the price levels of homes being bought and sold that really has had the biggest influence on the median home price. And so you see it's up there, it's up 19% over first quarter or second quarter of 2020, and it's up 23% since second quarter 2019. But most of that increase or a great deal of that increase is a shift in the distribution of the sales distribution market shares. And, and because of the way the arithmetic, the median is computed and same for the average, even more so uh, that you see that. The, the key number there is active listings. You see it in the red box. They're down 42%. Uh, and the month's inventory, 1.4%. Again, in Aggie speak, we ain't got none. Here's what uh, existing home sales price to list price. This is also indicative of a tight market. When homes are selling for 100% of what they're listed for, when, when buyers are talk, talking to uh, sales uh, sellers or sales agents, and they're not able to negotiate the, the list price down, and in fact, are being asked in many cases to pay more than the list price. And as you can see, Austin here is almost off the chart. Uh, uh, on average, uh, the, the existing home sales, the actual closed sales price is over 100, almost 111 percent, 111 and a half percent of the list price. The, that's the original list price. We do watch it. Watch it. Uh, we, re, we understand there can be uh, increases in the list price over time, but we relate it back to the original. Dr. Gaines. You know, I know I, we're running out of time. You know, I hate to cut you off. <laughs> I know I can see I can see the clock you, on you the on my in here, I'm ready for questions. I know, I know. But I, right. I, I am sensitive to our, our team's time here as also um, Dr. Louts has a hard stop at 2.30. And I want to make sure that we are able to answer just one or two questions for her that we've seen come through the, the chat. And then uh, just a reminder to our attendees today that we will be sharing these slides. So don't feel like you missed out. And we might even pick up here with Dr. Gaines here in just a second. Um, Dr. Lutz, are, if you're still here with us, if you would pop back on, we did have a, a question or two with regards and I'm gonna kind of field back up through the chat and um, boy, do we have a lot of information. Hold on one second, let me see here. Uh, we had a question. Christine, you might need to help me for a second. Oh, here we go. I know. Okay. I got it here. Um, on the point, um, Dr. Lotz, about re-emptying the nest, are you saying that the young adults that moved home during the pandemic are beginning to enter the real estate market as buyers now? I think that there's a good mix of folks. Some are going just back to school. So they're going to be going back to college in the fall, um, not necessarily buying a house. Um, there's going to be folks who are going back into their metro area where they were renting before, um, and perhaps now their CEOs are saying, you need to come back in at least a few days into the office. So they're going to go back into their home city um, and, and rent. And we are seeing that rental prices have been going up and are reflective of that. The demand is very strong in some areas. Um, but I do think that the opportunity that young adults have had in the last year to move home if they wanted to, to not pay rent and to save for a down payment. And with one of the first stimulus packages that were out there, um, they were able to have a 0% interest uh, on their student loan debt and automatically go into forbearance. So if they had a higher interest credit card or if they wanted to double down on that student loan debt because they didn't have an interest rate um, and could really pay it off like a zero interest credit card or something like that, they had the opportunity to do so. So there are, they have that financial leg up, some young adults. I'm not saying this is widespread, but there are some young adults who do. Um, we've done some recent research on that. We're gonna be pushing it out soon. Um, I can't give you a, a solid date, but I will say giving some hints there, there's a mix of people who might be in a better financial situation. Thank you so much. And then one other question we had was, what is one thing that agents can be doing to address the disparity in access to homeownership for communities of color? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So I have to say that if you're on this presentation, you guys are one of the involved people who are the best and the brightest. You probably already have taken the Fairhaven program. You're well aware of it. You probably know about the color of law. Um, those are some of the resources I would say that are out there. Fairhaven is a free uh, program that was pushed out this year. It's a training program, a uh, little fake city simulation about different fair housing practices. It's great. I took it. I thought it was awesome. Um, so I would encourage that, but encourage folks who aren't listening in today. Um, maybe say there's great resources out there. The Color of Law by uh, Rothstein is a fantastic book on the topic if you want to educate yourself on it. Um, but also just learn about the issue. And I think be cognizant of the issue, I think is step one in really closing that gap. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And then um, Dr. Gaines, I'm going to open it back up to you real quick. What are your thoughts, or maybe this is really a question for both of you. Um, what are your thoughts on entrepreneur, entrepreneurism? Um, for those also that have gone back, not gone back to work in the traditional sense, but maybe exploring the entrepreneurial world. Um, what are what are people doing? Are they are they starting their own businesses? What are we seeing with regards to the uh, unemployed people that have lost their jobs? Uh, well, we were anticipating. I don't know if anticipating is the right word. We're very hopeful uh, that the entrepreneurial spirit will come back. Texas is known for it. Uh, Texas is one of the states, for example, that it's, it's one of the uh, laissez-faire states, less government intervention, so it's easier to go into business in Texas than in many, many other states. So we are and have been counting on that. Uh, that I showed you that Texas leading index, uh, weekly leading index chart a little while ago. That's one of the variables that we include is uh, uh, new business applications, uh, which, which would, is the bet, you know, one of those measures that you would have for the entrepreneurism. So yes, we're, we're, we're very cognizant of it. It's one of those things, it's a little bit difficult to follow, but, but I would suggest all of you in, uh, listening, you're probably seeing it. Uh, you're, you're probably seeing restaurants reopen uh, some of them under new new uh, ownership, maybe under a different name, uh, it, but that's going to take time. We we suspect that we won't see the impact of that for a minimum of another oh end of this year six months, but we'll really see the impact of that picking up and showing up more in the economy at the beginning of next year. Because even if you are an entrepreneur and trying to get into business, it takes you a little while to get it kicked into gear. Thank you. And I'm going to morph, um, Jean is on the on the chat here with us, but I'm going to morph one of his questions with regards to both of your presentations. Um, Jesse, you talked about some of the, the Zoomers and the younger generation, even the single population that has really entered the market, single females have entered the market. And um, how does that relate with short-term rentals? You know, here in Austin, we have short-term rentals, we have ACL, there's a lot of um, clout, I guess, in buying properties that could be used for short-term rentals. So could we be making some of the same mistakes with everyday people buying these multiple homes and leveraging that short-term rental? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I know there's a lot of competition right now and we're hearing from agents that there's not only buyer fatigue out there right now, it's agent fatigue. It's really hard to put a first time home buyer, a young cash strap buyer who might not have a huge down payment or huge earnest money into a home right now, it's making everyone really exhausted. Um, and a lot of the competition out there are investors and a lot of them are vacation buyers or wealthy folks who can pick up that early retirement purchase. Um, and so that's the competition that's afoot and is making it very difficult for those young millennials or even Gen Zers who want to enter the, the market into in and be able to. Um, I would say that short-term rentals are, are great for some economies. Certainly there's a lot of folks in Austin who want to come and play for the weekend. I certainly have before on a girl's trip um, and it's a beautiful city. Um, so I, I think in some areas it's a positive thing, but it does make it hard for buyers right now. Thank you. Dr. Gaines, any thoughts on that? Uh, not, not particularly, but it did, it did trigger a couple of thoughts in my mind. 
uh, the, the short-term rental is a, is a difficult business, both for the tenant and the landlord. Uh, and, and we may see landlords uh, moving to the short-term rental because they may be anticipating that in the short, in short run, when that lease gives up, they can increase their rents faster. Uh, on the other hand, the, the tenant is there on a short-term basis. Sounds like they're not sure of what they want to do, whether they want to be a, a renter or an owner or Maybe they're just not certain about certain things. Uh, the other thing that I'd, I'd point out, one of the things that's happening in the housing market, it's, it's also there in the Austin market, the increase in, in single family rental and the increase in institutional buyers. Uh, we're, we're seeing a marked increase in that uh, around in the markets that we're monitoring. Uh, the home builders in, in our major metropolitan markets Dallas, Houston, Austin, particularly, uh, we know of at least several examples of the home builders building entire subdivisions of for rent housing. And the key there, the business model is that when they build these subdivisions, they're selling all of the properties generally to an institution, a REIT or what have you, a, a, a fund buyer. Uh, but these houses are not coming into the market as inventory uh, for home ownership. And this is another thing that's keeping that that home ownership uh, issue and the and the stock, the inventory of homes available for sale uh, limited. Well, Dr. Louts, thank you so much for coming. I know you have a hard stop and we certainly could talk about this all day, yep. but I want to uh, let you go and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Dr. Gaines, if you don't mind staying on, we do have some more questions for you. Do you have a, a couple more minutes for sure, us? Sure, sure. All right. Well, you know, yeah. we just can't get rid of my, it. My hard stop is at cocktail time. Oh, well, you know, we like that. So let's uh, try to get out before cocktail time, but we will yeah. definitely ask you a few more questions of you. Um, let's see here. We well, I wanted to point out the slide that's up here now. Okay for people in Austin to see what prices really are doing based on repeat sales, not the median. And you can see that Austin at 38.4%, you almost don't want that guys. I mean, it, it's good news, bad news. Remember how I started this whole thing. Uh, it, you know, it sounds great. If you're a homeowner right now, boy, that's terrific. I got my house, look at it, it's going up astronomically in terms of, uh, this is the actual increase in the price it has nothing to do with that distribution of the sales. Uh, this is the same home selling again and then selling again and we compute the rate of increase. Uh, that, 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 that's nuts, quite frankly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, really strong, strong market. Uh, I don't know that I would expect that to continue. Uh, so I just thought I'd show you, and here's what we're looking for. I wanted to get you on through uh, these are our new forecast numbers. Okay, great. Uh, I was I was telling Christine yesterday on the phone. These are brand new. These just came out uh, yesterday <laughs> from the Real Estate Research Center, uh, and and you can see that 2021 we're still looking for such a strong year. That's that yellow column. Uh, just home building, the permits, the sales. The growth in sales is going to be four or five percent, you know, around the state. Uh, Dallas is a little bit slower. Houston's a little bit higher. Uh, price per square foot, which we use in our forecast, uh, we try to get it down on a common denominator of a per square foot. But you can see that 2022 slows down. And that, that headline I showed you about the, the market slowing down, that's to be expected. Those are still very good numbers for, from a historical perspective. They just don't look as good as 2020 and 2021. Would you call that normalizing? Yes. And in economic terms, it's called reversion to norm. Yeah. I got to give you the 25 cent terms. Well, thank you. I would, yeah. I would think though that, you know, and, and I don't want to put uh, words in people's mouths, but you know, with, with agent fatigue, like we talked about earlier and just the rising demand and it just being such a hot market that normalizing feels good. And it's probably good for everybody um, all around. And incidentally, the, the, the sort of the flattening out or the normalizing of the market is still occurring at a very high level. 
It's not falling down. It, it's just the, the rate of increase is slowing down. We're still busy. Life is still right. good. Sales are still happening. It's just not so crazy. Now, if you want to impress your clients, you use the 25 cent. We're increasing at a decreasing rate. Tell us what that means. <laughs> it means we're slowing down. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's see. We had uh, another question, Dr. Gaines. Can you touch on the impact of sales prices, property taxes, and the future effects of these? The other question we had was with regards to the luxury market, specifically for Austin and for homes sold over the $1 million mark, which is a rising trend here in Austin. What trends are we seeing in price per square foot for high-end homes? Yeah, the, the, the high-end market uh, right now just doesn't show any... Uh, any particular uh, evidence of, of, of it slowing down as much as maybe the whole mar the market as a whole. Uh, the only thing that would slow that market down is, is it, it gets exhausted. There, there's a limited number of people who can buy a two, three, four, five million dollar house. And once you run through the, the stock, if you will, of the buyers, then, then that market will re reduce. The thing that's been happening in Austin in particular, is the number of people who are moving to Austin from out of state, particularly the two west, the coast, the east coast, west coast, particularly the west coast from California, who come in and maybe they just sold their shack in California for a couple of million bucks and they come to Austin and they're just astounded at what they can get with that kind of money. So right now that's, that's been fueling that upper end of the market. Also, we heard uh, earlier uh, about uh, people taking advantage of buying luxury second homes. Uh, and, and that has maybe been affecting, uh, I don't know in Austin, I, I would put this and reverse the process here and ask the agents in the audience uh, if maybe that's been some of the effect, particularly on the high rise condominiums that are fairly pricey there in Austin. Are these being bought as primary residences or secondary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. Oh, so I'm going to answer your question with a question. There you go. Well, uh, as we close out, and, and that is an open-ended open question, um, but I want to, we have one more question from the audience and then uh, just wanted to hear your closing with regards to any last minute slides that you wanted to share with us and then we'll send everybody on their way. One question here we have is uh, for single family rental inventory in Austin, do you see that the number of units will likely decrease in some areas significantly due to the continual increase in property taxes, lowering the cap rate, making the property less attractive to investors. Well, that's a, and, and that question has come up a number of times. So I, I'm not surprised. In fact, I'm, I'm only surprised that it's taken this long for the question to come up. Uh, you just saw that 38.4% increase in the resale and, and so forth. You just saw and I can, I can show you that uh, the median price is up something like 42%. The tax assessor is not, uh, is not ignorant of these things. <laughs> uh, and it is gonna start showing up uh, on the property tax bills. And it is gonna start at some point having some impact uh, on, on ability to pay and willingness to pay uh, these top level prices even for the even for homes in the two, three, four, five, two, three, four hundred thousand bracket, because nowadays you're buying a house for four hundred thousand that a year or two ago might have only been three twenty. So so you're 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 looking at that kind of, of, of impact on the prices. Uh, it is going to show up in the tax roll next year. It it didn't show up as much in 2021. It's going to show up in 2022. Uh, and and uh, it's not clear yet uh, how that's going to to play out. It 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 all goes back to ability to pay. And if uh, the people who are buying the house today for four hundred grand can 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 absorb the kind of tax increase that's going to probably come along, then it it won't make much difference. But it is going to it is going to play a role in it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, why don't you close us out, Jim? Give us your crystal ball. Tell us what other slides that you really want wanted us to hear today, and we will we will close out for the day. Well, 
I, most of you are, are well aware of the things that I was going to say uh, in terms of how strong the market is. The demand, the influences on the demand uh, are still there. The demographic uh, influences are still there. Uh, it's been interesting, and you saw the statistics earlier about individuals, both single uh, male, but also especially single females that are entering the market and so forth. The economics on the demand side are, are pretty much there. Uh, the only real negative there is the pricing, uh, the, the level of prices moving up. We just talked about taxes will go up along with it uh, if, and the effect that's going to have on the, on the uh, demand side. Supply, this is not going to balance out in the, in the short run, in less than a year. Uh, we're just limited with the supply of existing homes being offered for sale, and we're also limited on the supply of new homes uh, being offered for sale. And again, on both of these things, the costs are, are volatile. It is good news that the price of lumber has declined about 60 or 70 percent since it peaked here a few months ago, but it's still more than double what it was pre-pandemic. So it's good news, bad news. We'll have to see. I wish everybody a lot of luck and let me know if we can do this again sometime. Thank you so much. And thank you all for sticking with us today. It's always such a pleasure to have Dr. Gaines and the pleasure of Jessica Louts as well from NAR. Um, we'll have you back, Dr. Gaines. We love having you. You're one of our faves. Before we let you go, um, I just wanted to make sure everybody sees what's going on in the chat. If you liked this presentation, we have a lot more to come. Our Think Up Live is coming in August. We also have some great contracts classes, great classes for brokers coming up um, as well. So go to awar.com slash calendar. I know Christine is putting everything in the chat and we will see you all next time.